Hi, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Graduate School of Architecture lecture series, practice lecture series. Uh, we're at the Graduate School of Architecture at the University of Johannesburg. And this evening, we are welcoming Marlon Darbo from Trinidad. He's joining us from Trinidad today to talk about his practice. So welcome. And um, as I usually do, I just want to give a little intro to the um, lecture series before I introduce Marlon. Um, the practice lecture series, the intention of the practice lecture series is really to kind of open up practices to students and to the public so that we have a chance to see just how diverse practice can be, creative practice can be. Most of our practitioners are architects, not all of them are. Um, Marlon is actually not trained as an architect, but he is a designer. And I think his work and his practice that I've known for around 20 years now um, is a really exemplary of a really highly motivated and creative practice. And I'm really looking forward um, to seeing Marlon's work this evening. And I'm going to introduce him shortly. Um, but as you are aware, this is one of a series of lectures. We've had Craig McLenahan, Nabil Essa. Uh, last week, we had Melanie Archer from Trinidad. The week before last, sorry, we had Melanie Archer from Trinidad also. And before that, we've had Patricia Bandora, Sampiwe Mlambo, Tita Shitatala, and Chinunia Chikuga, who are talking about their graduates of the GSA, talking about their emergent practices. And next week, we will have Studio Contra, um, and they are actually going to be here live. Well, Ole Inka, the second Jay, will be here presenting their work at the GSA. We're going to record that, and it will be available online um, for any of you who wish to watch it. Um, they'll be talking about their exciting practice based in Lagos. Um, they visited two years ago, and we're really excited to have them back. And they're going to be speaking about how they make some really quite extraordinary buildings in Lagos. Uh, so, as I said, the intention of the lecture series is to kind of look under the bonnet um, at these different practices, and I'm really delighted to introduce you to Marlon Darbo this evening. Uh, Marlon is the founder of By Making. It's uh, an object design studio. Uh, Marlon's practiced in a variety of disciplines. He's worked in communications design, identity design, packaging, environmental, and furniture design. And he comes from a family tradition of making things in workshops, either at home or very close to home. His father manufactures sheet metal mailboxes. His great uncle was a welding fabricator. And his grandfather specialized in the making of wooden windows and doors. So he comes from a, a line, a traditional line of craftspeople, of, of people making objects. Marlon is interested in how his family making traditions intersect with his practice as a designer, and he uses the convergence to formulate ways of creating projects. Through design and making, he investigates the relationship between the utilitarian, the everyday object, people and place. His research focuses on the reinterpretation of traditional and familiar things with an intent to develop new, unexpected, beautiful, and desirable objects. Each object resounds with the value of working with different types of makers and technologies to provide the basis for creating sustainable processes and relationships. Marlon's investigations into design and making have led to exhibitions locally, in Trinidad, and internationally. Pira, a reinterpretation of a traditional small bench as part of the Global Africa project at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City in November 2010, Verb, Beyond the Mask, Storytelling in Black Art and Design, Balance, the T T Texas Contemporary, uh, which is curated by the Black Artists and Designers Guild. Marlon is a graduate of the College of Arts of Science, Technology and Applied Arts, COSTAT, and the John, Tom John Donaldson Technical Institute in Port of Spain, Trinidad. So I'm really familiar with Marlon's work. Uh, I would say his extraordinary work from my practice in Trinidad. And I'm really excited to see what he's going to share with us this evening um, and what we can learn from it, um, what we can learn from a maker um, who defines himself and his practice as by making. So Marlon, I'm going to hand over to you. But before I do, 
I'd just like to share with everybody, if you could make sure that you keep your microphone and your video off because it can interfere with the sound quality. So just be careful. Uh, if, the, if you don't turn them off, we will. We will kind of edit you out. Um, and the other thing is, for those of you who want to get CPD points, we will post the link for the CPD points in the chat after Marlon has finished his presentation. So you can find the details of how to register for your CPD points there. And then, of course, if you have any questions, if there are any comments that you have while you're watching Marlon's presentation, please feel free to post them in the chat um, and I will kind of moderate them um, at the end of the, the presentation. Um, so I think that's pretty clear. So Marlon, I'm going to hand over to you now. Welcome to the GSA. It's great to have you here and we're all really excited to see your work. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thank you to the GSA for having me here today and, and all persons that are present. If you could just give me a sec so that I can share my screen before we begin. So I'm, I'm Marlon Darbo, uh, a designer, as Mark said. Um, today I'm going to try to uh, talk you through my journey um, as a creative, as a designer, and particularly as a designer um, living and working in Trinidad and Tobago. My my conversation is going to be framed around uh, the development of my studio by making, um, and, I, and I'll talk about how it became uh, to be named such. Uh, by making specializes in objects uh, and spatial design, uh, mostly operating in the space of object development and can both be uh, non-functional but also predominantly functional objects. Um, I'm a multidisciplinary designer and I've worked across uh, many industries. Uh, and five years ago, uh, I founded a studio uh, with my uh, good friend, Blaine Clark, which is called Practice. Um, you know, spelled interestingly, uh, as we designers uh, do, uh, communication is, is key and the way in which uh, things are named uh, are also important to, to, to what you would like to communicate. Practice focuses on visual identity design editorial design, packaging design, and campaign design. So I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, and it's a small island in the Caribbean. And in thinking about uh, the theme for today's talk, I couldn't help but sort of frame it in the context of this notion of working uh, from home. I, I literally do work uh, from my home studio. Um, but more importantly, I think this notion of home, the idea of place, is really important to the development of, of individuals, um, of their pursuits in life. And I felt it really important to sort of think about the significance of place and how this impacts on the work uh, that one makes. When you live in a small country, there are lots of limits to navigate, uh, lots of constraints, uh, both in terms of materials and, other, and, and also other types of resources. And what I thought about was this notion of possibilities. You know, coming from a small country doesn't necessarily mean one cannot um, produce um, a high volume of, of, of quality objects and ideas that can themselves become a way of identifying um, with where one is from. You know, I was I was saying to a friend that I have to give uh, this talk, and it it made me sort of go into all of my archive, into my archive, and to have to think about what was I, you know, really gonna, how I was I really gonna frame this conversation. And what's what has really been important to me, and I just I found this quote that I had noted in one of my sketchbooks uh, that says, you know, how you think about yourself matters by Laurie Addison. But taking a step back and having a conversation with a friend of mine, Richard Rollins. I realized in that moment that the most significant thing, at least for me at a particular time in my life was really att attempting to establish what I thought of myself. Um, so my talk is going to both uh, sort of move between um, the how and also the what. In 
1985, um, I would be about, you know, 10 years old. Uh, my parents uh, moved to uh, Trincy. They had just bought uh, their first home there, the place that they reside today. Trincy was a new community, a community filled of a lot of young people, young families. And in thinking about that time in my life, I couldn't help but focus on the fact that what was very, insp what was very inspiring looking back at it is the fact that there were young families attempting to sort of shape um, to be future young minds. And the, the adults that I would come to know as, you know, I think fathers and mothers of our community really made a significant effort to shape the way in which we think about ourselves, the way in which we behaved, we acted, and we represented our new uh, community. Uh, many of the people that I grew up with in this neighborhood are still today my really good friends, some of them playing um, even more significant roles in my life than others. Uh, but looking at this time, I, I would say that it was sort of the beginning of shaping what I would uh, become. Coming out of Trinity, uh, to the left, you see an image of uh, a football team. And I guess as most young people would do at this time, uh, sporting activities were all part of your, your growing up. But in this instance, um, why, why I do see um, you know, this having a, uh, a really significant kind of impact on how I uh, view things was because football not only um, was about recreation. Um, you see, this guy here who's kneeling is Calvin Jack. Uh, he became one of the greatest goalkeepers uh, in the Caribbean. In fact, representing Trinidad and Tobago at our first ever uh, showing at uh, the World Cup. And next to him, you know, further left is Stern John. Stern John, also uh, one of Trinidad's greatest footballers as well, went on to represent Trinidad and Tobago as well as play internationally in the UK. And both these young men at that time showed a propensity for love, commitment, and dedication to their sport that in fact became their careers. And my level of admiration for this way of seeing an activity that was going to become the way in which their lives were going to be shaped, I think st stuck with me. But in that moment, by the age of 14, you know, I played football with this team up until under 19. I also represented my school uh, in football uh, to the right. This is a newspaper clipping from a game that my school um, was playing. And in the caption, it says, passing through. In looking at that, I, I can't help but think that when I reflect on the way in which I admired Stern, Kelvin, and, and a few other of, of my contemporaries who went on to do pretty well um, in their careers uh, through sport, for me, it was almost as if I was passing through. Yeah, um, I had not yet found, uh, you know, my calling, not quite understanding or being very clear on what direction in life I would like to take. This is Arthur Jack Brown. Um, he was both uh, my head coach at um, my community team as well as my school team. And Arthur, um, a really, really nice guy, but extremely strict. Um, I remember one time having, you know, he, there was a way in which he would say to us, I would, I would give everyone at least four or five guys, because he had this like massive American car, right? Uh, and, you know, I mean, that back seat was so wide, I think six, but maybe six, six uh, guys could fit, uh, fit there. And he would say, you all need to meet me at the corner of your streets at a very specific time. If you're not standing on the corner, I am not going to stop and wait for you. 
And in fact, one morning, I was literally six feet from that corner spot. And Mr. Brown literally drove by with a grin on his face. And when I got to school, he said, I told you, if you're not on the corner waiting, I will definitely pass you by. What Arta represented was a level of discipline, commitment, and dedication. And he expected a higher level of excellence from everyone at every moment. And for him, you not only represented uh, your school team, your community team, you represented yourself and your friends and your family and your community. And this is something that, you know, really did um, have an impact on me. And I see him as one of those central figures in the way in which I would go on to um, think about myself and think about how I approach my work and the level of, I think, dedication and commitment to this craft called design. Uh, once I graduated from secondary school, uh, I continued playing football and thought about, you know, do I uh, explore the possibilities of playing semi-professional football? Do I attempt to use football as a means of um, advancing myself? And one night, Arthur gave me a call and said he would like me to join a semi-pro league in Trinidad and Tobago. There was this new football team, I believe, called Foot Golf, if I can remember correctly the name. Um, if I would, if I was willing to join and become part of the club. And in reflecting on that question, I recognized that there were two things uh, at that age that really um, got me excited. One was art, and two uh, was football. But it was really clear that my admiration for Kelvin and Stern. And the conversations I would have with them made me understand that the ch my chances of becoming as great as they are in that sport was almost unlikely. And in fact, I may have a better chance placing my energies and commitment in this idea of art and design. I would apply to John Donaldson Technical Institute to do my diploma in graphic and applied arts. I was accepted. and. During that moment of uh, studying graphic design, um, I started to uh, support myself financially through uh, painting of t-shirts. To the, to the left is what I would call my, my first uh, home studio. What's pretty interesting is sometimes, I don't think, yeah, in, this, in this shot, you can see there's a, a timber uh, board that I would place on the bed with a sheet of cardboard next to me with all my paints. And I would paint these t-shirts very late into the night, many times my little brother, because we shared a room, would complain that um, I was keeping them up uh, late at night. Uh, soon after, uh, as I, you know, sort of built a sort of momentum, kind of built a community around uh, my creative uh, production in the area of t-shirt uh, painting, um, you know, relatives of mine suggested that I should consider coming to the U.S. where there's a large Caribbean uh, community and many events that uh, maybe persons would be interested in uh, my work. So I took the opportunity, uh, packed up my suitcases with, you know, I, I, I think I probably packed about 100 T-shirts. I think I spent painting and kind of getting ready for, for this trip a couple of months before I did. And, you know, my plan was I would go to New York, I would sell some t-shirts in New York, and then I would take the uh, train and bus um, down to DC, uh, set up studio. To the left is an image of me set where I set up studio in my uncle's house. Uh, and, and, you know, produce uh, my work while also uh, attending these events. But on my way to New York, um, I had one of the most, I had a very scary sort of experience um, in that moment. I, I, I landed in New York and Border Control, Border Control basically randomly uh, pulled me aside. And uh, they opened my suitcases. Now, in those days, you know, I think as a West Indian kind of family, uh, you know, everyone is kind of sharing their luggage. 
Uh, my aunt had this uh, storeroom with suitcases. My, my father got two suitcases for me uh, for this trip. I got there, the, the bags were open, and they saw what looked like some sort of a uh, powdered substance. I mean, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't, I, I would, it was me moving from why am I being stopped to questioning whether I'm innocent or guilty. And, you know, they tested the powder, it was negative, tested the powder, it was negative. And somehow I kind of switched on and I realized that my dad had in fact to use um, powdered soap. And, you know, I mean, if you ever met my dad, he's, he's very, very particular about things, about space um, and wanting, you know, things to always be in pristine condition. My dad had actually, in fact, uh, wiped my luggage uh, with dissolved soap powder. And unfortunately, that powder did not um, dissolve so, you know, enough. Um, so I was suspected of uh, importing drugs into the US. It took me three hours to get out of the airport and eventually I went on my way. It's something I always remember when I think of painting t-shirts. Uh, my, my, my activities or, or, or creative output in terms of t-shirts were both, or I should say across, uh, you know, it's kind of abstraction, uh, you know, the, the sort of reinterpretation of uh, a geographic, a National Geographic uh, uh, cover, as well as things that were very directly related to Trinidad and Tobago culture, the image at the top right um, showing a steel band side uh, performing. And I think this image probably was either taken from the newspaper or a magazine. So this work moved across those spaces as a sort of a way of, um, I guess, um, you know, building a level of desirability based on the kind of audience and, and market and what people were into at the time. Well, no, no. A few years while I uh, into uh, producing my shirts, a good friend of mine was a salesman at a company called NBC Signs, which was also part of a larger company called NBC UM. And that's really significant because NBC UM produced uh, furniture and NBC Science produced uh, signage. One day, my friend said to me that uh, the company is looking for a graphic designer uh, to be part of the sign company's team. I said to him, well, you know, Randy, uh, I mean, I can, I can draw, I can paint, I think I can develop ideas, but I don't have any formal training in um, the use of uh, software tools. He said, I do think, I think you should really come and speak to Keith Loveless, who at the time was the uh, kind of creative director manager of the sign department. Um, I did the interview, I was selected. And because I had no software tools training, I had to figure out a really kind of quick way of addressing this reality. And I, and I said to Keith, you know, how, how am I going to function daily? if I can't use the software uh, that is re required for the job. And he said, well, the job is two parts, right? There are moments where you are going to be operating, uh, using the software, having to then develop the, you know, the designs and, and prepare our work. But many times there are also going to be moments where you have digital prints that you're going to have to project and it's going to be very technical, uh, uh, tracing of uh, letter forms for the uh, fabricators in the shop to produce. So I, I created this kind of really, I think, uh, looking back on it, uh, you know, it's, it's really kind of fascinating that I actually uh, got this to work. I quickly kind of looked through the phone book, looked through um, the newspapers and found a course um, in software tools. And what I was doing is on my evenings where I had no class at, at John D, I would then go to my software tools class and I would literally take my projects briefs uh, from the from from the office and ask my my software tools lecturer to actually show me um, what tools are required and how to use those tools in order to uh, accomplish the the uh, the brief. So there's this kind of way I was kind of improvising. I was I, I wasn't. Um, 
I I was sort of taking full advantage of the opportunity that was in front of me, and very quickly, um, I settled down within um, this space. And I do think it was a, sort of a pivotal component of my development because here I was a graphic designer who was being trained, particularly in operating in a two-dimensional space, but functioning in an environment um, and developing a a developing experience between the relationship, that relationship between design and manufacturing. So I, I wasn't just um, looking at the printed page. In fact, I was actually now engaging with materials um, in a real way because I, I was not um, removed uh, from the manufacturing environment. The, the design uh, studio within MDC Science was literally a part of the manufacturing. And this to me was really fundamental you know, me walking past the, the, the larger factory where MBC I'm going to be producing uh, different types of metal chairs um, and other metal types of uh, components, um, you know, was literally, was was there, um, you know, kind of allowing my mind uh, to take shape. I had this really interesting experience that for me sort of sums up uh, sort of two things, right? You know, this, this old saying about measure twice, uh, cut once, but really about understanding manufacturing. And so one day I had a task of, as I, I usually do, you know, varying sizes and types in developing uh, drawings for a neon fabricator. Now, when you are, when you're making neon drawings, uh, because the, the fabricator is producing those drawings uh, producing the at neon blowing uh the glass um, with the electrode which is the electrical component that actually is connected for lighting of um uh the the neon um, those electrodes need to be facing him in fabrication so as as the graphic designer your responsibility is to produce those drawings in reverse now it's okay if a letter form or a graphic element is symmetrical because that makes it uh, more likely that you're not going to have any issues. Unfortunately, I drew the entire sign uh, the right way facing, and two of the letters uh, were manufactured in reverse. So in that moment, I mean, I was literally, um, I'm, I don't want to use the word, and I was, you know, we would say cuss out in Trinidad, right? You know, I was reprimanded uh, heavily uh by senior members of the team uh because a project like this had a very high value and there was a, a very serious kind of knock-on effect to the mistake that i made which i always felt you know the fabricator could have um helped me out by reviewing the drawings but it did teach me a, a very great lesson about paying attention and understanding uh you know process uh, and understanding different requirements for different types of uh, design production. I eventually got uh, married and while, you know, at that very same moment, I met my former lecturer of John Dalton Technical Institute, who advised me that the program was being um, reshaped into uh, an associate degree in visual communication design. Um, and uh, John Dawson Technical Institute was being renamed as COSTAT. And he said to me, I think that you should, uh, you know, um, think about applying to the program because it, it, it's, it's gonna be, you know, I think really significant for your, the, your development. My wife and I had a conversation about it because in this instance, it was not, it didn't mean me studying in the evenings, but this was going to require a sort of a different kind of commitment uh, because it was a program set um, uh, day hours. Uh, we made a decision um, for me to go back to school and in re-entering, you know, sort of an, an educational environment, um, I think I, I got to sort of appreciate 
um, the the many years of a couple of years or probably four or five years of working as a young designer because I had gone back to school now armed with a lot of knowledge in aspects of uh, design production that many of my um, classmates uh, didn't have um, access to that knowledge because most were were, were not um, didn't work either within industry um, or had not worked as yet. In graduating from uh, Costat, uh, one of the things that we had to think about was the of creating a self promotional campaign that allowed us to market ourselves to potential employers, agencies, or you know publication houses. Uh, newspaper houses, and I developed this campaign that was sort of um, risky in, 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 in some sense, at least looking back at it. Uh, it was a three-part uh, idea. Uh, first, I would send out uh, a greeting card to the all of the agencies on one day. Uh, three days later, I would send out um, this image on screen you'd see is it's like not packaging, but it's packaging. Um, it's an object. There's no real use um, for this form. It's more about uh, kind of articulating this idea of, I don't know, kind of unpacking of, of the things that I think were important um, in terms of process, purpose, attitude, communication. I was also playing with uh, ideas around pulling from uh, things that were part of our visual culture. Uh, the yellow and red sort of patterning is really about uh, sort of uh, 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 leaning towards um, tree plumes uh, matches, which are a, a brand of uh, 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 lighter lighting matches uh, that we have here uh, in Trinidad. And my idea was that this pack would go flat to the agencies. And then three days later, I would submit another another component. And that component was a quarter uh, paint can. And what I did was I used a spring from an old bed frame that I would have found. And I, I packed all of the cans uh, with these bed springs. And the top of the spring, I created a platform. And on that platform, I placed maybe around 20 pieces of my work. And I would, you know, shut that can close. I uh, added a can opener, placed it in brown paper bag, labeled very kind of discreetly. So it was it was basically a white white sheet of paper, name of the creative director agency. And I dropped these things off at about four agencies one one day. And on my way back home, I got a phone call uh, from one of the agency heads, uh, Sandy Morrison, who immediately demanded that I come to his office uh, the following day to see him. Uh, I mean, I went home. I was pretty excited. I felt like, wow, you know, for him to have responded so quickly, I'm definitely going to get a job. Obviously, this is a big deal because I've just spent sacrificing the last uh, three years. And I was very, very um, kind of optimistic, um, hopeful. And, and I would say that John Dawson Technical Institute by Central Costat, Val Ramcharan, and Elizabeth French as lecturers were very, very encouraging about, um, you know, looking at life with a sense of possibilities, looking, about, looking at your, your creative outputs and the possibility of you as a designer um, entering um, the marketplace um, to see things in a very big sense. So there I was pretty excited to show up for this interview. And I got to the interview, and this is not the, the piece, obviously, but I, I, I try to sort of quickly kind of illustrate that when this can explodes, you're talking about 20, you know, something pieces of paper, small pieces of paper strewn across or over this man's um, office. And he, when I arrived, he said, have a seat. And he said, let me tell you something. Um, while I was amazed, and that's the reason why you're here, you're also here because I wanted to tell you that 
that stuff could have damaged me. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, I did not think about that part of it. You know, I was so excited about this idea of creating a surprise, right? You know, I think you've seen these things in cartoons where, you know, there's the clung um, uh, thing that's stuffed in the, in the carton and when that pops up, it's like a whole surprise that I didn't think about the fact that this metal cap will be, you know, potentially be hitting someone in their face. Long story short, I got the job and hence began my uh, career working in advertising. Not too, too long after working at Colin Morrison Belgrave, um, something that I, I was on my mind all the time, which was uh, pursuing um, higher education in design and art. I decided to take a trip to New York to visit one of those uh, portfolio uh, portfolio days. Um, I think it was hosted by Pr Pratt, SVA, uh, Cooper Union, and one or two other um, universities. And I took with me uh, these sketchbooks, which at the time I, I was producing kind of quietly, that was somewhat unrelated to uh, my study in graphic design but were just things that I felt um, sort of kind of compelled to produce uh, this whole notion of observe observing um, life around me and sort of thinking about what those things mean to me um, and, and making images uh, sort of a, a, so accordingly. On this trip, I would have met with a few um, heads of uh, departments, um, had my portfolio, my, my wider portfolio um, uh, reviewed, um, but why I, I selected to show these images is because in one of those conversations, I was asked if I had ever thought about building some of these components. And it was something that I, I never really thought about. Although, even when I look at the promotional materials uh, that I was making in John D, as well as other components uh, through projects that we uh, were tasked with producing, um, there was always this sort of um, leaning towards moving between the two-dimensional space and the three-dimensional space. And in this instance, obviously, I'm using paper and, uh, and treating with, with, the with, with it as an, as an environment. And that question uh, kind of stuck with me. And on my return to Trinidad, you know, there was uh, a lot of potential for me to move abroad to study um, design. And... You know, what was, you know, one thing I, I was significant and I'm, I'm thinking about it is that one of my lecturers uh, or teachers at all levels, uh, Deborah Clement, had given me this Pratt University prospectus. And in it, I think those images related to industrial design um, had somewhat stayed with me to a bit. So that part of my aspiration was, was possibly linked um, to the way in which um, I think persons around me were also uh, um, encouraging me to to pursue um, a, a, a wider um, uh, practice. Um, that year on my return, uh, Melissa and I found out that we were having a baby. And as I think any um, you know young parents, we thought it would be best that we focus on you know building our family and building our lives. Um, here in Trinidad, uh, because yes, we both, uh, you know, had aspirations of of, of moving abroad, uh, but we had a little one on the way, and that was something that was like a really big deal, right? Um, really important um, responsibilities that we were um, embracing uh, fully and and pretty excited about. So, you know, the idea was I'm going to put my head down and focus on developing my career here in Trinidad, or at least uh, in the you know, sh uh, short term, my, my plan is to provide and, and build uh, you know, my, 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 strong, uh, my strong family. And while working at uh, Colonel Morrison Belgrave, you know, I'm working in advertising. I'm, I'm around a lot of creative practitioners who I think are were really strong. And one thing that stood out to me was persons like Richard Rollins, Dave Williams, uh, and one or two other people I would have met. Their their 
their creative outputs were so uh, dynamic, right? It was not about, uh, you know, coming to work, doing an eight to four, responding to briefs only within the context of the agency. But in fact, it was bigger. It was as if it was as they, they had uh, very expansive um, creative lives. And that's something that I, I really uh, admired and, you know, began to sort of um, replicate in the way in which I was thinking about myself and the way in which I was wanting to shape my own, my own creative practice. And this led me to think about um, very clearly um, what it is to be from here, but also to be thinking about looking and looking out. And around that time, the internet was obviously access to, to seeing the world beyond uh, books in a library uh, was becoming possible because, you know, via a few clicks, we could now, you know, here's a moment where um, access to imaging um, was expanding. And I wanted to attempt to develop uh, ways in which I can uh, grow my visual vocabulary and grow resources that can then help me perform um, across many aspects of developing creative outputs. And one of the other ways in which I did this was by developing a sort of um, a really committed and, and sort of intricate uh, portfolio uh, 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 sketchbook uh, system. I, I made, I literally made my sketchbooks uh, rather than buying them initially. Uh, they were sort of elaborate. I would come up with themes for their covers. I would make drawings, um, writings. In this instance, I would come up with these ideas of, you know, now our, our ideas are taxable 15% VAT. And maybe I think I'm listening to some, uh, you know, things around the economy in terms of politics and responding to it uh, in the context of, 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 of these sketchbooks. But these sketchbooks also... And I think one of the reasons for making these covers, to me, they set the tone for what, what and why I was going, what I, why I was going to produce inside of, um, of these documents. And, and here's an example of a sort of self, a self-initiated project that was based on uh, me paying attention to my environment and, and this idea of around um, the shape of things. And I would look at things in our environment and create these silhouettes, which was also connected to, um, as a graphic designer, working uh, and developing identities, you know, creating symbolism. So here I am sort of practicing that idea of um, kind of grabbing what the environment has to offer and turning them into graphic uh, elements that could be used maybe in the present or in the future. Um, I think to this day, uh, this has stuck with me in the way in which I see things. Um, and it's called Shape of Things. Um, I created a brief around maybe having an exhibition, uh, you know, how the, can these things then influence page styles in terms of editorial work. Here's another cover where I, you know, it's, I think it's called Idea Banking, right? Um, kind of hitting the nail on the head, right? And that's the point sometime of, when a creative idea works. Here's another sketchbook. And in this instance, and this is where some of my sort of uh, kind of, I, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying kind of philosophy, but I was becoming a little more refined in, in how I was thinking about what I was doing. And here, this notion of a dance between the intentional and the intuitive um, became, uh, a phrase that, be, that be, it became a phrase that was very important to how I saw uh, creative uh, production. With all intent, so you also have to rely on those intuitive moments uh, that are sort of built into the process of making a work. Um, I like to say that it's almost like those kind of really um, kind of beautiful discoveries um, that you didn't think about, but they reveal themselves. Um, through the act of uh, producing um, ideas or uh, developing a project. This idea of um, 
you know, that dance between intuition and intent sort of expanded into this symbol, sort of representing the left and right side of the brain. Uh, and at the time, many of my contemporaries were also freelancing. And I asked myself, you know, what, what would a call, calling card look uh, for me? Yeah. And seeing that I was so interested in, you know, the, you know, the folding of paper, um, the making of models, my experience working in signage, uh, my, my, my inclination to constantly somehow, somehow move beyond uh, the two-dimensional space, I started thinking about this uh, calling card that would be a form, uh, a little box in the middle um, that two blades were attached to. My name would be written on either side and other contact details. Uh, this thing has three holes. Maybe it could be a pencil holder. So I started to think about kind of multi-use for this small object. And one day it fell off. Uh, my desk, and then followed up my desk, it rolled, and that, for for many persons uh, in the studio, they laughed. They were like, "Oh, wow, that's interesting. It's like a little toy," and the connect sort of kinetic properties um, kind of built into the object, and the way in which the object was created kind of revealed itself uh, to me, and, I, and I'll get back to this project's significance as I go through my presentation. Uh, my sketchbooking uh, sort of continued. Um, here I am, uh, you know, making a lot of notes. I, I think I was trying to, to, in thinking through this presentation and looking at these notes, you know, I'm looking at that little note other that says, you know, you're required to utilize all tools to achieve your goals. And that, to me, that speaks so and, and for me, speaks so importantly about one's practice, and you know, there's so many things that one can consider a tool uh, that contributes to achieving um, goals. Um, I think this is this whole kind of conceptual notion of of these flutes, these flutes undulating, and um, I think that's a big D made made out of a lot piece of cardboard, and those flutes kind of like when you pull in a Put the top layer off, design is really um, this sort of process that's somewhat undulating, right? It's 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 never uh, 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 flat. And, and 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 that's about the sort of kind of a hills and valleys, the ups and downs, um, you know, the, the easy moments, the hard moments, um, you know, this idea of you know getting down in the, the valley and coming up and seeing more possibility and to the right and making notes about a potential design week in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, I can't remember, maybe I think of this is probably in collaboration with maybe members of the studio within CFB is having those kind of broad conversations about um, design as a conversation. Uh, because I think in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, what for me at least at that time was, it was very clear that carnival, fashion and architecture were very outward facing, very clear ways in which one can sort of understand um, the contribution of design has to a society. Uh, while in advertising, design to, in many respects, while it served uh, and, and contributed to communication, I don't think it was necessarily um, very uh, high um, in terms of priority. Uh, so there isn't necessarily a while there are a lot of uh, graphic designers um, in the Caribbean, I, I don't think that community is um, large and as um, sort of structured professionally um, in the way in which I think uh, uh, carnival designers, fashion designers and architects uh, are operating uh, within a space like Trinidad and Tobago. So here's another example of one of my sketchbooks. In this case, it's gotten a bit um, very um, sort of lazy, um, no fancy cover in this instance. Uh, but this page in this book um, is a really strong marking point. At Collier Morrison Belgrave, I, you know, I mentioned Richard Rollins. Richard Rollins uh, became a friend of mine uh, when he became the creative director of uh, CMB. But before Richard becoming the creative director of CMB, 
um, at the agency, I was working on a project. Um, I think it was a branding project. And uh, unknowing to me, Richard was asked to visit the studio one afternoon to review the work I was working on. And in him coming, you know, he came. Um, if anyone knows Richard Rollins, he's a very matter of, matter of fact guy. Uh, if he says yes, it's yes. If he says no, it's no. Uh, very decisive. Uh, he's, he, he came, he looked, and he left. Um, he didn't say anything to me. Um, my project continued. Project was pitched to the client. Uh, we won the project. Um, project was published. In Richard becoming the creative director, I would then learn that he said to uh, my seniors that there was no need for, for them to call him because he believed that I was on the right track. He believed that uh, what I was producing uh, was was definitely in line and uh, in line with the brief, but also sort of captivating. I um, mean, looking back at that moment, I think also what I was trying to do was kind of slightly different from, uh, I think it's it kind of model around um, the making of graph graphic elements, particularly around branding within the agency, because agencies' uh, primary purpose is not about visual identity identity development. Um, it's more about general marketing and kind of consumer hard nose hitting uh, communication. And this said a lot to me about um, about Richard and his um, his his humanity, uh, because any other person in his shoes, uh, there was a chance that they would have actually found a way to um, sort of derail uh, my output, right? And my my respect for him learning that after has 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 always been um very 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 high um, and why this apple is important is that when richard became the peer director of uh, colin morrison that Rave, one of the things that he wanted to to instigate was this notion of designers need to see the world right we need to experience life beyond uh, our immediate uh, agency culture as well as outside of the island of Trinidad and Tobago, and even outside of the Caribbean. Um, he was instrumental in securing a program where uh, two members of the creative team would be sent to conferences globally. And this apple represents myself and a colleague called Shana Sarrett, who would go on to the AIG, AIG uh, which is now, you know, everyone knows it, AIGA, which is the American Institute of Graphic Arts uh, conference in New York. Why that conference is important is because persons like Sam, Sam Heck of Industrial Facility, uh, David Kelly of IDEO, I had the opportunity to visit the studio of Frog Design, who were uh, part of the development of some, some of Apple computers um, hardware. Um, it was the first time I literally walked in to what I would call uh, a clearly uh, a design practice where um, the, the focus was on development of objects, um, both in terms of electronics, furniture and otherwise, as well as a, a level of um, graphic design and branding. Um, the entire experience of their studio was also really um, amazing to myself and um, uh, Shana Serrett. This um, page in my sketchbook uh, at, that, at that time was basically a an idea that I had, and Richard said to me at that point, I think it's time that you start to take your ideas out of your sketchbooks and and take them into the world. Uh, you are you are producing ideas outside of your your agency um, responsibilities, but no one is getting to see them. At that time, uh, Dave Williams, who's featured in the image to the left. Uh, Dave is a co copywriter, a strategist, a choreographer, dancer, was having a performance at Alice Yard, which is a contemporary space founded by Christopher Corze, uh, Nicholas, Hug, uh, Nicholas uh, Lachlan, and uh, Sean Leonard. And Dave said to me, I can introduce you to Sean. One afternoon, Sean did in fact visit our office. Uh, Sean and I had a conversation a couple of days later. Um, about me potentially having an exhibition at Alice Yard. Um, I mean, I was extremely, extremely nervous because here I was never 
um, producing work um, on a large scale and doing so in a public um, forum. Uh, Chris Cosa, um, who whose work I had followed for, for many years um, and who has been a, a, a very strong influence on the way in which I think about things like, you know, visual vocabulary um, was also part of this uh, sort of ongoing conversation. Um, and Sean, and they said, yeah, you know, you can have, you can have this, um, you can have your exhibition. I think Sean always makes a joke that I was, I was allowed to paint on the floor of Alicia that I think no one else was able to do at the time. Um, I had this exhibition called On Roots of Bridges and Barriers. And this was a response to uh, the construction sort of uh, infrastructural development taking place on a major highway that connected uh, south, uh, east and west of Trinidad. And I sat for, for I mean, late every morning in traffic uh, because of this construction. And I had made notes about what that meant and uh, about what that meant in the broader context of our social economic sort of um, reality. Uh, those uh, white boxes are uh, benches that were response to the barriers that are usually placed on the median. Uh, the 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 N uh, uh, table and there's this kind of old kind of performative environment around um, you know above board on the table uh, the 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 opportunities for these types of projects to facilitate corruption um, were were also sort of uh, being addressed um, here and for me this was a moment of sort of combining my understanding of graphic design and communication design, working in advertising, understanding advertising and marketing, um, as well as my interest in uh, the development of, of objects. This exhibition led to many opportunities and it's something that I, I think it's, it's really important to, to understand is if you are not working, if you are not producing, then you're not necessarily preparing for opportunities that can come your way. And I learned that very kind of significant lesson, great lesson in that moment of um, having the exhibition at Alice Yard. Uh, Christopher Cosier and Sean Leonard uh, had asked me now to design an album cover and album packaging for Sheldon of 12 The Band. Uh, Alice Yard also had a band room which uh, 12 was the resident uh, band. And, you know, in that, I was like, okay, so I have to design an album. And normally, you know, CDs are plastic cases. Uh, you know, you can see the CDs through the, 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 the plastic, kind of very mediated, you know, doing uh, flat sheets. And Sean and Chris said, no, we would like you to think about this as an object in the same way that you approached your on route project uh, how can you then think about 12 the band's album in the context of an object that allows it to be experiential um, versus just the typical? And I developed uh, this packaging, which is based on you know an accordion, and there was a uh, a pigeonhole uh, basically on one side of the the uh, pack, which allowed you to see the lyrics. Of some of the rest of these of some of these songs on the inside of this of this box. I was also um, fortunate to have uh, edited the original identity created by Christopher Corsair uh, for Alice Yard, also working um, in the area of developing a kind of a typeface uh, for them. This was then uh, shown as part of the anniversary celebration at Alice Yard. Sean Leonard designed uh, this uh, uh, space. It was a ramp that started to the front of the property, extending all the way to the back and then with terrace seating. Uh, these uh, three uh, uh, long rectangular uh, boxes had uh, prototypes of the 12 the band packaging and inside of each of those uh, uh, pigeonholes, you can actually um, look at the process of developing um, the the concepts uh, for the album, and those are three posters to the top that featured, uh, you know, the Alice Yard box, um, sort of kind of you know, being within uh, 
the environment and also containing the environment. One other opportunity uh, that was that, that came to me that really expanded my capacity was Jazz on the Beach. Um, York Structures Limited, which um, is a structural engineering firm in Trinidad and Tobago, the owner owned a hotel uh, that's now called Mount Turbin Resort. It was called Mount Turbin Bay Hotel and, and Golf Club in um, the smaller um, island of Tobago. And I was just asked to do a flyer graphic, which this image is an, a photograph of, I think it's printed on a t-shirt. I, you know, was invited to the event. Um, it was fantastic. But then I was asked to go beyond, um, because of a mishap, someone actually was responsible for doing this space. They, they, whatever they did, um, by the time the event um, time came, the actual canopy um, or fabric elements that they had um, strung up literally um, fell. Um, so they had to kind of fix that. And I was asked to think about working on the entire project the following year. Um, this led me to being introduced to Sam at uh, Kalalu Company. Kalalu Company, um, you know, founded by uh, Peter Minchell, uh, one of the greatest um, artists and mass uh, designers, uh, you know, who would have also done uh, work for the Olympics. And this project um, was quite interesting because treating with a beachfront requires understanding uh, that inherent in it is a lack of permanence. There's no way we can um, utilize structures that are going to be remain that are going to remain on the beachfront. And I had this very sort of rudimentary concept around getting access to the equipment that the York Shock Test team had while at, in Tobago, digging these you know five feet holes, um, and then filling uh, uh, steel buckets with concrete with these steel posts, and then creating these environments that would create shade for the the audience um, of of the event. I worked on this project. Um, for over 10 years, as in every year I would do a different iteration. For the first three years, I recycled a lot of the infrastructure that we developed in the first instance, like these um, steel uh, buckets with concrete, um, the fabric components, and I would make different sort of, sort of programming the space in different ways to use the same elements and using small addition to the budget to add um, further components. This then went into uh, becoming a little more refined in, in my output and engaging with York Shockers Limited to develop uh, more sophisticated sort of infrastructure because they had the capacity, both in terms of manpower as well as equipment, to be able to facilitate this. And this image shows um, another iteration, one of the iterations of the Jazz on the Beach project. Uh, Christopher Cosey approached me one day and said that there was this uh, international competition for uh, design objects uh, for a show called Next in New Orleans at the Becker Gallery. And I thought about what project would I um, build because I had never put it in a competition. I've never actually formally built an object in this sort, in that particular kind of context because En Route wasn't necessarily about an object. It was more about sort of only mostly about, about space and objects. And, and telling a particular kind of story. This led to the, the development of what became Verb, and it's called Verb because it's a doing thing. It's uh, multifunctional. Um, this one object can be transformed into a stool, uh, a low table, um, a light, um, as well as it can be rolled. And, and that rolling was encouraged by the fact that we, I discovered that it can roll when it fell off the table at the agency. I went on to produce uh, two more iterations um, of Verb. One to the left, um, that was me kind of experimenting. With if I use a particular kind of material and a particular type of um, surfacing, you know, the textures, um, I would I would be able to achieve. Um, to the right, it's uh, about the manufacturing uh, approach. Uh, those components to the right are folded aluminium sheets. Uh, the the mahogany box is uh, CNC cut as well as um, you know joined um, you know by a joiner. 
now I kind of got to a place where I, I think I was becoming a bit more formal and beginning to sort of form a language from all of my learnings. And in, in this moment, I started to think about something about what I was doing was still really about the, about making ideas and not necessarily rooted in some clear sense of I don't, like a kind of design ideology or, or, or philosophy. And it, it made me sort of step back and, and look at my, my, you know, at home and home being, uh, my, my family tradition, uh, my, as Mark would have uh, mentioned, uh, at the top of the, uh, presentation, my father manufactures uh, metal boxes, my grandfather uh, specialized in the making of wooden doors and windows, and my great uncle was, I think, one of the finest um, welders uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, was a welding engineer for uh, BWIE, um, which is now Caribbean Airlines. And I mean, I actually went to get my car fixed one day at an uh, um, air-conditioned uh, uh, place and when my name was written on the bill, the owner said, I know your great uncle. He's a fantastic welder, like one of the best you'd ever find. Um, that sort, those sorts of things are, are really sort of interesting. Um, I was very fortunate to go to primary school uh, very near to my great uncle's workshop. And every day I would have to wait for my, my father to pick me up there. And in reflecting on it, what I recognize is that this idea of making was just something that was around me so much. And while I was sort of operating within the sort of graphic design, more, I don't know if you want to call it sort of steri sterilized uh, version of, of output, right? Because workshops are, are dirty, uh, they are hard, they are noisy. Uh, working in advertising and working in a, in a design studio is very far from that kind of environment. So in me going back home, it allowed me to um, you know, conceptually think about how these traditions can have an impact on me as a designer and an impact on the work that I make and, and what those, what that meant was taking the consideration materiality, you know, in a, in a more intentional way, as well as manufacturing processes. This is my father's small workshop. This workshop is at home. Uh, what connects my grandfather and my, all of my, uh, I think those three men is that they, in the tradition, I think of a very sort of a small environment, small country or small space, idea is that resources are limited and they all developed workshops and businesses on the same premise premises um, that they lived. Um, I think my, for both my grandfather and my great uncle, they had two adjacent properties that uh, one was home and one was workshop. Uh, my father has built um, different iterations of his workshop over the years. Uh, here, here he is. Here he is uh, in his workshop, you know, moving um, between the both spaces. This then uh, led to me developing this project called Pira, which looked at an historical or traditional object um, known um, particularly in the Eastern community, but I think periods exist all over the world. And I was beginning to look at my father's way of making, as well as my own idea around, you know, use of paper and folding of paper. One day I had a conversation with Sean Leonard about this object, and he brought up a really interesting question around uh, the capacity, my capacity in terms of taking the consideration you know, the traditions of woodworking as well as sheet metal making and pushing the context in terms of cultural usage. And this led to the creation of Pira. I went further into thinking about my father's um, mailboxes and deconstructed uh, this unit to then discover the way in which it's constructed to then develop something that's, that's um, I think my own kind of use of the idea of a container, uh, not for mail, but for plants. And this is where I, you know, really strongly began to look at the, the, the connection of workshops and intentionally seek out working with different types of makers and establishing 
significant relationships, even sharing a meal with some of the people that became really strong friends of mine. Uh, one significant output uh, through a factory slash workshop relationship is my relationship with Robert Tanyuk, um, owner of TYE Manufacturing. Um, there, I mean, they are large manufacturer, but there was very there was there was relativity between my father's output and, and their output, and I designed uh, and working with the TYE team developed uh, the facade of the factory, uh, particularly with these um, perforated sheets and then doing their canteen furniture. So vocabulary became something that's really significant and sort of part of my entire um, kind of approach to work. Uh, dish out is all about the way in which we, you know, sometimes have to improvise using a plastic plate to take out food at a, you know, a beach outing. Uh, fender is a reference to a fender bench. Uh, fender bench being reference to a truck, truck fender. Loud bass is about a speaker. Mr. Side Table is my fascination with gas tanks that turn into timber, large uh, metal plate, uh, sort of mimics the idea of a midnight robber, which is why it's called Mr. Side Table. So language in terms of words, how how we speak and, and our vocabulary, um, our jargons become part of my process. Uh, these are two chairs. They're in the front yard. They're basically like making a scene. And out in the idea that we, you know, it can function both with, you know, inside and outside, but outside the idea of out in, going out. And pallet, um, I've always had a thing for pallet sticks, um, you know, the popsicle uh, sticks, um, as well as my observations of uh, vendor carts. Uh, this project was developed. And more recently, um, my ability to, or at least my, my, me getting the opportunity to share the way in which I worked. I hosted a workshop. I, I participated, facilitated a workshop hosted by the TTIA a few months ago, where I asked the audience members to take a look at three familiar things, a coal pot, a cookie broom, and a typical household plug and develop projects, ideas, and prototypes uh, based on that. In for my own, you know, now I'll kind of kind of get into this phase of me sort of developing a, a kind of a home studio, and this is uh, my home studio um, designed by Sean Leonard um, that I, you know, was built two years ago and still in development. Um, there's the out and bench prototype, and one of the things that have become really kind of part of my practice is the use of ideas or forms and objects that I think can be useful around my own environment. I've become a sort of a testing ground um, for experimenting. You know, those three shells um, are actually shells that I have been, I have designed and I've been working on. Uh, this was the first um, version of the uh, balloon boxes that I built. These have been in the yard for a very, very, very long time. So this idea of testing in one's own space. Um, again, my fascination with uh, gas tanks. And I visited the Noguchi Museum, I think two years ago, and I got this bright idea that maybe I can start placing, uh, you know, more formal finished objects in the garden. And, and maybe the entire garden at one point, some point would be um, filled with interesting uh, forms. And this is the last image I will uh, show. And why this is significant to me, because it's part of, there's this general sense of how I, I like to uh, think about work, um, that noting possibilities. So I no longer only rely on my sketchbook for documenting ideas, but I also rely on opportunities like this to document ideas. I was sitting out front one day on these tree stumps and thought about what would happen if someone wants to place a drink. You know, they have to place it on the ground. Um, how comfortable would they be? And I had this metal bracket and I placed this as a reminder that I should one day um, design a cup holder that can easily be placed on tree trunks or on places um, depending on the owner's need. And I'd like to say uh, thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Marlon. Really extraordinary presentation. What a lovely range of work and what a lovely story. Um, that you've shared with us. And I know that there's 
a um, couple of hands up in the chat um, with some questions. I'm just going to go straight to them um, and, and ask people to share. Um, Richard Mark Rawlins has his hand up, so over to you. I just wanted to say um, that I thought this was it was a brilliant um, presentation in terms of Marlon's practice, and um, I felt the need to say something here because um, if you know anything about Marlon, is Marlon is made up of a lot of parts, and it's way more than I think he's actually shown you in the um, in this presentation. But I think one of the things that's really significant about Marlon is how he works and how his mind works. And that everything that you've seen here, I believe is um, just an initial version of where it's actually going to end someday. And I think everything remains in a sort of transition. And I think that's a lovely part of the design process. And I just wanted to um, say that. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you, Richard. Um, yeah, there's a comment here. Andre Grissel says 100. <laughs> so that's a good, yeah. a good comment. <laughs> and Fred, who does all our graphics um, at the GSA, says stunning work, so inspiring. Um, yeah, are there any other um, comments or does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask Marlon about his work? Any reflections that you have, any thoughts you have, anything that the work has stimulated in your uh, in your mind, in your thoughts, and then please feel free to ask. So Natalia says, thank you, Marlon. I love the sense of humor that infuses your work. It's infectious. Your work reminds me of both a Alessi design and a South African sculptor's work called Eduardo Villa. You might want to check his work out. I need to write that down. <laughs> yes, Ed Eduardo, the Spanish spelling, and Villa, like Villa. B I L L A. Okay. Yeah. Lots of nice comments. Definitely check it out. Yeah, very inspiring. Thanks to you. Very inspiring. I enjoyed. Thank you, Marlon. You've let us see a happy approach to design and work. I have a I have a question, Marlon. Um, mm -hmm. That um, you know, I, I'm familiar with the context in which you produce your work. Um, yeah. When you, when you were speaking. You know, you referenced uh, a number of people who, you know, you've been mm -hmm. around. You started off with the footballers, um, mm -hmm. uh, and and what you learned from that community, and mm -hmm. you know, what, something we talk about at the GSA is this idea of creating a community of practice. It's one thing being labelled in a particular discipline or whatever, whether you're an architect or a graphic design or whatever you do. Um, mm -hmm. The idea of existing within a community of practice, I think, is a really important idea. I wanted wanted you, wanted to know if you could just share a little bit about that. Uh, I mean, you've mentioned some individuals, Dave Williams, Richard, you know, a mm -hmm. few people. I just wondered if you could just reflect a little bit about that, the importance of that to you, of being in a community. Yeah. I mean, you, you've, you've referenced the people, but if you could talk about the value of that as a practitioner. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think and I think that's why I started off with the image of myself within the community as a young man, um, because I think it's something that you, you don't necessarily think directly about at different stages in your life. Um, but definitely once I ventured into becoming a professional designer, uh, the importance of the community has been very, very, very significant. I mean, I have not called a list of names of people that to me make up my community. Um, um, I didn't mention that I, I was also part of Above Group, um, Gareth and Alex. Uh, Gareth, you know, designer, strategist, Alex, photographer. Uh, on, on, on working on by my making Bloom, um, there were many people who were involved in that project uh, beyond um, Robert Taniel, the owner of TY, Melanie Archer, in terms of uh, writing and strategy. And, and I think it's it's really important to understand that a community is, is a community of friendship, but it's a community of professionals sharing in values and aspirations um, that, you know, that we all share and contributing to each other's um, development. Um, I think it's, it's significant. Uh, you know, in Trinidad, where it's uh, obviously a smaller environment, I mean, there, there are many other um, uh, at artists, art practitioners, 
uh, and other creative practitioners that have that form part of uh, my community. Um, and I think that has been really, really integral to my development. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Are there any other comments um, or questions or reflections anybody would like to share? Lots more nice platitudes building up in the chats. Anything else anybody would like to share? Okay, well, I think I think that's a, a nice end to the evening. And, and Marlon, um, thank you so much. Um, it's also been very um, insightful for me. As I said, I'm familiar with your work, but it's been so wonderful yeah. to see to see the arc of it, you know, and, and to hear you tell the story of the work and the story Thank behind you. the work. You know, I think that's such a, um, you know, we're, we're, we live in a world, oh, there is, an, uh, there is a hand up, sorry, there's another question <laughs> from Cat, Catlejo. Catlejo, would you like to ask your question? Um, hi, Manon, uh, wonderful presentation. Hello. Thank um, you. In, in terms of, um, a, a community. So, um, as as a practitioner, so here in South Africa, one of the challenges that we face is that um, we like finding clients. It's it's a very competitive space because of pricing and all that. So, I'm just wondering, um, how would you view the idea of um, collaborating in terms of like uh, starting an office? with people from different practices. So ideally think of something like uh, a work complex or a business complex where there are different types of businesses, but you do this intentionally to work with people so that you can be able to afford overheads. So how yes. would you infuse those other people's uh, disciplines into how you approach design? Uh, that's my question. Thank you. Mm, that's a that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I I have in the past been part of co-working spaces, um, not necessarily, and, and with with some underlying intent to uh, intersect people's practices um, to serve and to gain clients. I have to be honest, I, I don't know if I have the answer um, uh, mm. uh, to it, uh, because I think it's a complex one, right? It requires, it's, 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 it's an administrative um, sort of mm. economic model has to sort of be kind of figured out, um, because beyond the actual creative output or creative practice, um, how does it really, how does, how does all components kind of benefit, I think, would have to be sort of thought through. Um, because there's no, there's no, there's no need in creating an environment for for this to function without clearly having um, a kind of a clear model that that benefits all parties. Um, so I, I don't know if I have a, a very specific yeah. um, answer so, or solution. So if if I understand you, it it would be better to um, club with people who are not necessarily in the same industry. Like for example, I do architectural work uh mm -hmm. i also do quality control work at times so that mm -hmm. means i interact with contractors finishers and people in that kind of way of thinking so would you advise that yes. instead of just getting people for the sake of getting people yeah so i i can you know, not be a the the question sort of sitting on my mind um so practice as a design studio currently uh, is maybe an average of six persons daily, um, mm -hmm. but the studio is actually maybe about 14 people, right? And that's because, you know, there are, there are other practitioners who have their own um, uh, uh, operations that are, that are almost developed very strong um, working relationships with us that we can be going after projects knowing that our team can expand or contract based on the needs of a project. And those things have been in initially organically developed, but through that process have been formalized. So there's a sort of a clear mm -hmm. sort of understanding. Yeah, so there are moments where we are acting as the persons who are uh, tendering um, for these proposals. And in some respects, um, a, a project is coming from one of our collaborators. Mm. 
Okay, I I understand because this afternoon I, I I a colleague of mine, I call him colleague, but he's actually competition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he suggested that we <laughs> should uh like work together. So I think I'll I'll give him a call and we'll discuss how we can uh join together because I, I it, it will work in our favor to do so. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, you're welcome. And Katleko, you have to tell us how it's going at the next practice lecture. I will do so. I'll do so. <laughs> yeah, report back. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, if if I can, uh, a, a bit of report back. Uh, I, I once commented on one of the uh, the sessions that uh, I've been reinvigorated by the practice lectures, mm. and um, one thing that I've started doing, I've started learning a new software so i use archicad okay. and i've started learning rivet uh, as part of like the motivation that i got and i do now uh like i said quality control work i do that professionally now it, it started off as a hobby but because of the practice lectures and how we are inspired to do like to do more than we can or try to do more than we can while upskilling ourselves so uh, it's working in my favor, and thank hey. you to to the practice lectures. So I'll try this as well, and I'll come back with feedback on that as well. Hey, thank you so much, Katleko, and that's really lovely to hear that um, the lectures are you know, having a, an impact. Thank you so much for sharing that, and thank you so much for the time that you put into this. It was a really beautiful talk, a really beautiful view. I think you filled everybody with a little bit of color and uh, light <laughs> and delight. <laughs> This evening. So thank you, Marlon. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank okay. you very much to the DSC.